tonight. Okay, we're being recorded. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows we're being recorded. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the first Rise event in, what did we say, like since over a year. Over a year. So yay for us. <laughs> Finally, we're able to meet in person because I can tell you as a person who loves social events, uh, doing it uh, remotely kind of sucks. And oh, yeah, for real. So I'm happy to see everybody here. Uh, so I'll just give a couple of uh, brief announcements regarding what we got going on for rise so we are for once ed and i aren't scrambling for presentations for the next couple of months so that's pretty cool so uh for the next couple of months i'll tell you what we've got coming up next month here at ecpi we'll have the fbi coming in uh we had them come in that was like one of the first ones we did wasn't it nate like back in like forever ago and uh, uh no it's not clarice uh but it's uh the guy's name is Michael Maynard, something like that. Um, but I've been talking to him and he is super excited about coming. In fact, he told me it has to be in person and we can't record that meeting. So uh, because of the content of what he's sharing. So if you want to see it, you have to come here. It's not gonna be posted online or anything like that. So it has to be an in-person meeting. Um, so in any case, we got that coming up. That event will also be sponsored by our friends at Fortinet who will be bringing in pizza and beer as well. So tell your friends, tell your friends, tell your family. Uh, we will be uh, having pizza, beer. will be coming in and doing an intelligence briefing for us. And we had an intelligence briefing from these folks at Carillion and it was super cool. It's not, it's, it's not vendor specific at all. It's just about how it's what they call the, uh, the life cycle of the spider and talks about just how the, the distribution of malware and, and just different ways that people are purchasing this, uh, purchasing hacks and different things. And so, it's pretty cool. So I'm really looking forward to that one. I just hate that we have to wait till September to get there. But then in October, we will be having, anybody know? Anybody know? B-Sides, right? I keep saying it. So B-Sides, October 2nd. So um, we are, the planning committee is getting that one together. So that one's going to be happening the weekend of, uh, or excuse me, on Saturday, October 2nd. We will not be having a RISE meeting that month because we will spend all of our energy trying to get ready for B-sides and then we will be exhausted. So we're not gonna be doing anything. Then after that, I don't know what we're gonna do. We might just take the rest of the year off. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but that's kind of what- B-sides, ROA.org. Yes, uh, it's on your little sticker there, B-sides, ROA.org, get your tickets. They are super expensive. Five dollars, super expensive. In fact, if you want to be a sponsor, that's even that's super expensive. It's 125 bucks or something like that. I, I mean, it's like super cheap. So you can like um, for anybody that we still have any uh, spots available. So, um, but anyway, so that's that's where we're at for that uh, tonight. We have automation with Ansible with our own Ed Summers who is uh, gonna be telling us all about Ansible because he's an expert at it, oh, right? And so this is gonna be super technical and super specific, right? Sure. Maybe not, maybe not, okay. <laughs> but uh, so what I can tell you about Ed is that he is a uh, IT network guy that kind of lost his way and like defected to the cloud. Um, so he is a cloud guy for the government or some super secret agency. He can't tell me or he'd have to kill me. And, but uh, we've used him several times and he, anytime we have anything about the cloud, um, we try to bring in Ed. So with that, Ed Summers. All right. Thank you all for coming. All right, uh, before we get started, just to survey, anybody, I know a few people have, anybody here used Ansible before? And one, two, okay, fewer than I thought. All right, I was thinking like half, three quarters of you. Uh, and the reason I asked that, so we, we put this together kind of last minute to fill in some, some empty space. And it's, it's gonna be a really basic overview of Ansible. Um, uh, 
uh, just a real simple introduction, mostly demos, uh, and we'll have some information online in the in the blog later on where you can learn more because uh, there's a lot of really great documentation online with Ansible. It's uh, fairly easy to pick up and it's really powerful in what you can do. Um, so really the goal of this was to just kind of, it, it was really for somebody that hasn't used Ansible before, never seen it before, kind of curious what they can do with it and kind of get an overview of, of some of the control functions in Ansible that really make it powerful for, for managing or, or configuring a large infrastructure. Um, so let's just jump right in. So what is Ansible? And I, I say it's automation, but a simple way to think about this, if you, if you do any kind of IT operations in your work, whether you manage servers, uh, you manage cloud resources, you manage network equipment, anything like that, there's, there's some level of day-to-day -day tasking that you do. Um, if you manage Linux servers, you're probably SSHing into a machine and managing the host firewall, adding some users, adding some groups. If it's Windows, you might you might do it through the GUI or you might use WinRM to log into that device and, and do some similar things. Uh, for me, for, for networking, you know, all the time we're logging into devices, we're configuring interfaces, we're setting up SNMP for monitoring, something like that. But you know that there's there's a level of tasking you get in, you're, you're hitting the keyboard and it's, it's different from every device. Okay, you, you've got to go in your SSH into Linux, that's different from uh, hitting a, a, you know, the web interface of a network device or WinRM on, on Windows. Um, so Ansible kind of helps you, kind of helps you ignore all that. It, it kind of abstracts that in a way to uh, where it uses modules and it says, okay, I know how to do this. You tell me what you need to be done and, and how you need to configure that. And I'll take care of all this backend stuff of connecting to it and inter interfacing with this device in the way that that it needs to see the data. Um, so the best thing about that, of course, is it can do that at scale as well, whether you're doing one machine, 100 machine, uh, 1,000 machines across your infrastructure. So uh, if, you like, if you like buzzwords, you think of the, the word force multiplier, it really is because now uh, where it took one person a while to do 10 machines now, or uh, you know, three people a while to do 10 machines, now one person could do that in less time. Uh, and it does this in an agentless fashion. You're not installing some kind of proprietary agent on the end device, okay? It's, it's, it's using either methods that it can to connect to it or something that's already on the device like Python, which is normally on a lot of Linux environments. Uh, you don't have to install anything uh, that's specific to Ansible. And that really gives it a, a variety of platforms that it can manage. And, you know, we can look at the documentation, but anything from Windows, Linux, network devices, clouds, even uh, software applications that it, that it can work with. There's a lot of integrations that, that it can do. And it's extensible. It's, uh, there's a strong community support for this. It's not just, you're not just using modules that Ansible, uh, Ansible develops. So you're not locked into uh, the time frame of Ansible, the Ansible team being able to develop something for for a specific device. Now the community can come in, build their own modules. They're online, free, free to download. It's great. So fantastic. Let's jump right in because I've got few slides because I hate slides. And uh, can you guys on the Zoom call, you're seeing my screen, right? I did not check that. Good there question. How, how, how possible is it to share your screen? Yeah, that, that would be that would be fantastic. At the bottom, share screen. There we go. Thanks. All right, you see in my uh, slide? You seeing anything now? Good to go, looks great. Okay, fantastic. Uh, quick overview on how it works. So we have the, the Ansible runtime. That's the Ansible code that you download. And with Ansible, it needs to know three things. What do you want to do? Where do you want to do it? And how do you want to do it? So the how to do it is handled with modules. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those later, but that's the, the extra code that you load into Ansible and it does all the, it's the magic. It's magic. Okay. Uh, where to do it is an inventory file. Inventory is just a text-based text file. Uh, it can take many forms, but it's simply the, a list of machines that you have in your environment or a list of 
devices that you want to manage in your environment. And it can contain some, some information about them. Maybe they're, they're all different and we'll talk about that too later. And what to do. And I'll show that up here just simplistically as a playbook. Uh, that's what Ansible calls the, uh, the list of tasks that it's going to run. It's in a playbook. It runs plays and tasks. Um, there's a little more to it than that, but just for this really simple overview, we're going to stick to a playbook. Okay. Uh, so three things. It's kind of simple. And really what, what you're doing when you're, when you're working with Ansible is you're setting up the, the playbooks and the inventory, uh, at least in the context of what we're doing here. And we're going to look a little bit about, look a little bit at that right now. Uh, so let's try something. So I can't get rid of that. Can I? That's all right. Okay. Lab is extremely simple that I have set up. This is just three VMs in the cloud that we're running. I have uh, one on the right. It's my control node. That's the one that has Ansible installed. That's the one that uh, we're going to run the tasks from. Okay, that would be your management machine. And on the right, uh, two windows there. We have a Red Red Hat eight server on the top and an Ubuntu uh, eighteen server on the bottom. And just to think about this really simply, Ansible just needs a couple of things. It needs to be able to connect to the machine and it needs to have some kind of uh, privileged access. So normally a, a user that has root privileges. Okay. And again, we're talking really simple just in a Linux environment for now. So we have basic connectivity, we have uh, a root user and, and password and let's just do a command. And type it. So what I'm telling Ansible is ping these machines, ask me for the password to connect. Hopefully that's still, oh no, I didn't, oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. These always work great. Okay, so what I'm telling Ansible here, Ansible run the module called ping, run it against all of my devices in my inventory and ask me for the password to connect because this is a real simple demo environment. So Ansible goes out and the ping module, it, again, that's where all the magic is. So it has this module called ping. Well, what does this do? Well, we consult the wonderful Ansible documentation and all this is online. It's easy to find. And I've got the camera in the way, but basically ping says, try to connect to a host, verify usable Python and return Pong on success. Real basic uh, connectivity test. Can I log in? Do I have Python that I can run my, my jobs on? If so, return Pong. And it's, it's nice, it's color coded, it's green, Pong, uh, great. I can connect to both of those and, and everything is, is fantastic. And what I didn't show you, um, very little in my directory that we're using here. There's a config file, uh, which we can look at it. And this is just set up for the, the demo environment here. Basically, I'm just telling it which inventory file to use, um, what user to use, and I'm suppressing some warnings that we just don't need to see in the demo. And that's it. And then the inventory is just the two machines. That's Super simple, right? Can't get any better than that. Normally you would have fully qualified name here or an IP address, something easier. Using the magic of Azure, it automatically resolves my host name. So I can just use a simple host name here. Um, we'll see a little more complex inventory later. But at a simple level, that's that. We can run another module called setup, which is kind of oddly named. You would think setup is setting something up. Basically what setup does is goes out to the, the device and gathers a bunch of data about that device. Uh, we can bring this, yeah, it's in the docs. I'm, we're not gonna sit here and read this, but it's, it's gathering facts about the remote host. And it's probably better just to look at it. So I'll kind of scroll back. This is still just one machine. This is one VM, all the data that is gathered. Uh, it's going to the machine, it's pulling things like host name, 
all the information about network interfaces, all the information about attached disks, about mounts, uh, whatever else. Great question. It is JSON. I'm good for that. Yes. Um, lots of standards in Ansible. That's one good thing about it. So this output is JSON, if you're familiar with that, JavaScript object notation. Uh, very popular, especially now with API access and a lot of, uh, you know, systems interconnecting because it's machine readable. Strictly formatted, it's easy for a machine to read. Not so easy for a human to read, of course. Um, it's not that bad, but you get a big thing like this and you can tell it, it gets pretty hard to pick it out. Uh, but it, that is JSON. Um, a lot of the, we're going to look at playbooks and things like that later. A lot of the input that you give it, uh, whether it be inventories or the playbooks, those are written in YAML. Uh, was that YAML ain't markup language? I think is what it is. Yeah, um, yes, <laughs> which love it, hate it. I don't know. It, it goes either way, um, but that's what it is. So uh, just a, a bit of trivia about that. This is JSON, um, but when it outputs, it outputs something at the beginning because this wasn't made. This was made to be human readable, I think, because it's logging the screen. It wasn't made to be passed to a system. So if I piped this output through something like JQ to try to pull it out, it, it bombs. Because at the top of that, it's putting like the success message saying, hey, I succeeded in gathering the data, here it is. And of course that's not JSON, that's not part of, that doesn't fit the, uh, the spec, so it bombs out. But uh, there's ways to output it. It's just, that's just a, it's interesting you brought that up because I ran into that problem earlier. Yeah, yeah, you can like pipe it through set or something, strip that out and, you know, if you had to. I mean, uh, but the thing to remember about this setup is, is kind of neat because it's pulling all this system data and we can use that later. We're going to see that later because, uh, like I said, it's in JSON. So you're seeing this key value pairs. Uh, Ansible user space with that 64. Uh, is there anything interesting in here? Oh, yeah, Python version. Ansible Python version 2717. Okay, that's the Python version that it found in is using on the host. So we'll look at that later. But that's just a real, real simple example. And I mean, that kind of sucks because you're looking at this as well, I'm going to manage, you know, a bunch of stuff by sitting here and typing all this out on the on the command line. Now we're not going to do that. We're going to do playbooks. So let's look at our first playbook. <clears throat> so when you're when you're Spinning up new new machines, maybe uh, the security minded person, one of the first things going to do is, you know, dish this password. We don't want password access, especially through SSH. We want to use keys. And hey, great use for Ansible. Let's uh, let's put some keys in your authorized keys file so you can log in with SSH keys and get rid of password. So this is it for a really simple playbook. And just to start at the top. Uh, this is one, what they call play. Uh, the first thing it says, what hosts am I going to run that on in my environment? All is just a simple keyword saying everything in the inventory, run it against everything. Uh, become tells Ansible, hey, when you attach to this device, you need to execute the super user. And they call it become because there's different ways you can do that on different machines. It's just abstract to say become however you need to on that, on that device. And then our tasks. First one, Give it a name because it's going to output some kind of log and you need to know what it's doing. Copy SSH key. And then this authorized key, that's the module that you're using. Now, how do you find the modules that you need? I, Google that. You know, I, I don't know a better way to tell you because I'm, I'm still not a pro at Ansible, regardless of what Rob tells you. Uh, but I'll go to the Ansible docs, do a search for, search for it, or just search for what I'm trying to do. And usually the module pops up. Uh, and let's take a look at that real quick because I can pull it up. Authorized key. <clears throat> and the document's going to tell you, hey, here's what it does. Adds, removes an authorized key to the key file. And then you have all these parameters uh, that you can pass in. <clears throat> and the nice thing about the documentation, it tells you what's required and what isn't required is optional, of course. Uh, but you can see in this module, we only require the key and the name of the user that it's going to be added to. And there's other things that you could put in there. Uh, so the docs really help you out when you're when you're formatting this play. Hey, what arguments do I need to pass to this, this module? 
So here we're just passing the, the two required ones. The key is going to be for username Ed. I tell it state present, which means make sure that this key is in the authorized key files. And I didn't want to introduce this too early, but key takes uh, one of two things, either a string, the actual key that you want to put in there, or a, um, a URL, which like if you have your keys up on GitHub, you can say, hey, go out to my GitHub, pull down this key. Uh, there's also, you can do things like uh, do a lookup, which will go to your, on your Ansible node, it goes into your operating system and says, hey, look up a file, IDRSA, easy enough. All right, so uh, first thing I need to do, I need a key. Probably should have a password on that, but not for this. And we'll just run it. And it'll fail because we're still logging in with the password. All right. So the output is nice and color coded. Will that stretch if I open that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what I was doing is saying, okay, I'm running your play. Uh, the first thing Ansible will do, unless you tell it not to, is gather facts. So remember that setup module that we ran, it gathers all the data. Unless you tell Ansible not to, it's going to do that every time uh, you run a play because it's there's some useful information that you can you can act on in there. And then it, it runs our play. Copy SSH key is giving me a yellow changed saying, hey, I did something over here. Uh, I actually had to make a change. And then you get a recap at the end. Uh, how many things were okay? How many things were changed? Did it fail? Did I skip it for some reason? Uh, and things are fantastic. And now I can SSH to my rel8 server without a password because I have my SSH key, which doesn't have the password on it. And all is fantastic. And the good thing about Ansible is most modules are adempotent. Does anybody know what adempotence is? Somebody knows. Uh, can you run them in, in the same order? Uh, Close. If you if you run it multiple times, it's the output is always going to be the same. So a good example would be uh, what's not a dempotent. Something is not a dempotent. If I say just add one, okay. So every time I run that, it's adding one to it. It's going to be one, two, three, four. It's okay. Uh, something that is a dempotent is something like this. It says, put this key on there. Okay, well, I put the key on there. If I run that again, it's going to say, uh, okay, the key was already there. I didn't do anything. Okay, so no matter how many times you run this, if you tell it the keys that put the key there, it's going to put the key there. If it doesn't need the key, if it already has the key, it's not going to put the key there. Um, so it's just, you know, it's nice. <laughs> uh, one important thing to remember, though, I think, I think in the spirit of Ansible, things try to be adempotent, but not everything is. So check the docs. Make sure you understand how the module's running um, for one reason. What else would you do? You would patch systems. So these are templates that are customizable. The playbooks. The playbooks are whatever you want to make it. Okay. Yeah, those are totally. You write them. You can download them. You and know, online. Doing? Yeah, that's. Yes, totally customizable. So this is interchangeable between Linux and Microsoft. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, I. Different languages. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't show that here, but yes, that's right. Uh, you can manage Windows, you can manage Linux, you can manage Cisco, uh, F5, Azure, AWS. Uh, I was talking with Aaron earlier. They're doing; he's doing some AWS stuff. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Is it, does the language to the playbook change based on the platform? I, I don't know what happened, to be honest with you. It's just, I, yes, I think I did. That's what I did. I got SSH. Yeah, I did. So, uh, 
kind of. Um, what you write depends on the module that you're writing it against. And modules uh, will manage different things. So like a lot of times with Windows, there's different Windows modules uh, that would be separate from Linux because it has to do things in a different way. Um, but it's uh, the format you're doing, it's all the same. Uh, it's all in the playbook and YAML. Uh, you're providing module name, arguments to that. That stays the same. And that's one of the big benefits to this is it's abstracting the differences in the back. But what is different, you have to choose the right module for what you're doing. Uh, Yeah. Just said it's unstable and it's not. Well, that's all right. Maybe it came back and they're just. It is. Okay. Hey, perfect. All right. If you have questions, let me know or uh, we can speed this up or slow it down. So I do have one question sure. relating to the authorized key file. Yes. So let's just say there's more users beyond just you. Ed. What if there's a, a let's say Rob user? Mm -hmm. How would you utilize the same playbook to both parameterize things grabbing your key file and Rob's key file applied to all servers? We'll probably touch on that here in a moment. Okay. Um, but if I don't, let yeah. me know. <laughs> yeah, because this was, so I really intended the brief to be for somebody that's really new to anim animation, automation, and especially Ansible. Um, <laughs> and after I went through and did it, I finally realized really all I'm doing is kind of a progression through some of the really basic Ansible control features. So hopefully I hit that, but definitely let me know if I don't. Um, but the second playbook here is is kind of expanding on the first and, you know, just running one task that that kind of sucks. That's not what we're out to do. We're out to do a lot of things and a lot of things at once. And uh, so what what else might you do to this server? Well, it's it's a new server. Maybe I'll update all the packages and, and we need to harden SSH and say, hey, you, you can't log in with your password anymore. Right. Because because that's just not a good idea. So let's look at a playbook that has three tasks in it. Um, first one, update all the packages. Again, I go to a module called package. Uh, this module is written for Linux environments and it's written to, to handle package managers. Uh, kind of neat thing about that is it'll handle different package managers. It'll do yum, it'll do apt. Uh, it abstracts all the commands behind that. And we're just gonna tell it, hey, uh, update everything. Make sure they're at the latest state. Uh, I could say present, that it's just there. Or I could say latest to make sure they're updated. Uh, next, we're going to harden our SSH config. And how are we going to do that? Well, right now, it's it's allowing password. It's uh, yeah, it's in there. So we're we're allowing password authentication. We don't want that. Uh, maybe we have in our source control. Maybe we have a standard SSH config that we want to apply to all machines and make sure that you know when Rob does something on machine. It has the same configuration as when I do it, you know, because that's a big problem we have. When you get a lot of people in the environment, everybody's it's got their case here, it's allowed these ports here, but not over here, you know, it's it's kind of a pain. And hey, Ansible helps us with that. Uh, let's centrally store our files now. So uh, here we're just going to copy a file. I'm going to say, hey, take this file off my local, my control node, uh, can be in other places as well, but I'm going to say, hey, take this file and copy it to this destination path, where? On every host in the environment, which is fine for us because they're all Linux hosts and, and that's fine. And we can do some other arguments from that, owned by root, you know. Uh, and finally, when you when you change your SSH config, you need to restart your service. Well, we got a, we got a module for that. Let's restart SSHD. Let's run. Let me know if I talk too much. It's exciting. 
All right, so again, we gather facts. Uh, it's updating all the packages right now, and I did this beforehand because uh, RHEL was taking a long time to update. I think it's on an older image when it, when it boots. So that one shows okay here. Actually, uh, we got an update on Ubuntu. Nice. And finally, it, it copied our files over. So both environments, it copied the new file and it restarted the service. Hey, awesome. Uh, did I lose my connection? Nope. And do -do 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 -do. who's that? Comment it out. Okay, good. So no more password off, right? And that's kind of cool. Hey, we're, we're hardening our environment. We can do multiple things. Fantastic. But uh, as we talked about before, we want we want things to always be the same. You know, we want them to be identical, So if I run this again, it's not going to copy the file, but it restarts that service, which we don't really want to happen because we didn't change anything. Uh, there's a way to handle that. Through a thing called handlers. Uh, you can tell Ansible, hey, I've got this, this task that only needs to run once if something has changed. So no matter how many times it's changed, I only want this this task to execute one time. So you put, can you see this in the back? Uh, you put in what's called a handler. And in ours, it's that service command to restart SSH. And we call it by notify. So I've got the, the implement hardened config here. Uh, just saying, hey, notify this handler called restart sshd. Uh, so if there's ever a change, it's just going to notify that and run it one time. Uh, here it doesn't make much sense because I'm only changing changing that service once. But if if you had something, maybe you have a web service and you're uh, updating the config file and maybe changing the proxy on it, something like that, doing several tasks, and you just want to restart that or reload that config one time at the end, that's where you would use that. All right. Um, and that's all kind of cool, but everything we've done so far has been kind of static. Uh, Ansible lets you use variables, and that's that's great. What's a variable? It's uh, it's variable. It's something you can define at uh, at runtime and and uh, uh, be dynamic, right? Yes, sir. You know, I need the fork in between the variables. Need the what? The fork. These quotes? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what happens in YAML, if YAML sees this bracket without the quotes, it's going to think that it's treating the, the information inside as a dictionary or a, a hash table or, or whatever you call it in, uh, in your language history. But it, it thinks that this is going to be a data type of a, uh, a dictionary. So the quotes are there to tell Ansible, hey, this is not a dictionary. It's actually a uh, uh, a, a, a ginger replacement. Uh, it's going to be a variable called packages, right? Um, didn't talk about it earlier. Ansible uses the uh, the Jinja engine. It's Jinja, right? Jinja two. Yeah, Jinja two underneath. Uh, Jinja two is like a templating engine. Um, you can take text files, put variables in, replace, make replacements, uh, and that's why you see variables in quotes and brackets like that. Um, how do we use them? We can use them simply. Uh, this one's taking a variable called packages and removing those packages. And it's taking an, a variable called bad users and removing those users. So how would we do that? Um, let's make a, uh, delete. yeah, so we, we say, what are our bad users? Uh, we don't want FTP user. We don't want the games user and I don't know, maybe we don't like, uh, what don't we like, VSD games or Vim, I don't know. Anybody like Vim? I know somebody in here likes Vim. <laughs> All right, and that, and did I? All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to tell it. Hey, use this. What do I call that? Is security ever an issue using this? I'm sorry? Do you ever have issues with security using Ansible? 
like the security team? I mean, like uh, hackable, mm. uh, open somebody it would be uh, difficult for somebody to get into it unauthorized. I mean, like if it's not a secure, if you don't secure your scripts, somebody could run the scripts for you. Yeah, okay, yeah. That would be, yeah. I mean, Ansible itself is just a, it's a runtime. It's just the application it runs. Um, yeah, the problem, so the problems would be somebody running your scripts, which would be more of a matter of getting to your control, your control node. Um, could be just the security of, of the playbooks themselves. Maybe you're storing those somewhere where they can, they can modify them. Uh, or the, the managed nodes, like my Linux machines here, if I'm exposing these SSH over the internet to manage them that way, uh, then, I mean, that's totally separate from Ansible. That's just, you know, how is your, how is your management access exposed in your environment? Um, I mean, the, the, no, the code itself, I don't see an issue with, it's more of the environment and your, uh, your source of truth, your central, um, where you're storing your playbooks and the playbooks themselves. Now, we talk about Ansible being very, uh, being supported by the community, a lot of community support, a lot of um, uh, modules available online for different things. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I mean, if you're pulling some from a, a sketchy site saying, hey, run this playbook, this will, you know, this will harden your server. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's not really a good idea to, to not vet what you're running. Uh, you're generally going to be safe if it's a a built-in module like you know Ansible ping, Ansible setup, the stuff we're using here, it's all built in and it's vetted by the community. But if you're running something written by a third party, you know, beware. Is there an auditing mechanism to tell like who ran what playbook and when? It's going to cover that at the end. No, there's not. Um, <laughs> for uh, I say no. Like everything in IT, it depends. On on face, no. I'm just running Ansible from Ansible playbook from a command line. Uh, if you wanted to, if you have heavy auditing on your control node, then yeah, you can say, okay, the username Ed ran this command at this time. And you know, you don't really do that. There's better ways to do it though um, with, with Ansible tower. And we can talk about that at the end, but they do have ways to, to do that. Just not with this, you know, unless you, you're doing the auditing yourself right. and then yeah. Great question, though. All right. Um, that failed. I'm not going to worry about that because you kind of get the idea. Uh, what do we have? Uh, yes. We talked about inventories. Um, you can do more with the inventory than just specify your devices. You can group devices. You can... You can describe devices with their own variables. You can describe groups with variables. Uh, there's a lot of power in which you can do just in your inventory. And, and just to simply show that, I've made an inventory here where we have the same machines, uh, Ubuntu 18, but I'm saying, hey, that's in a group DC East. And it has a syslog server, East server. We put the, the Red Hat in DC West, and it has, a, it has its own syslog server. Uh, Ubuntu is also a web server. Uh, the rel the rel is a database server. Uh, the grouping, the variables. I mean, it's up to your imagination on how how you want to do it. It can get really complex. It can be really simple. Um, and don't you know we're doing things in the demo just really simply, uh, but with variables and stuff, you can split those out to other files. It makes it a lot easier to manage. So don't think that just seeing it in the inventory like that is that's how it has to be. It's. So does that mean that you can run your scripts against those variables so you can say just run it against the database server or just run it against the domain controller or whatever? Correct? I don't even need to be here. You brief it for me. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. That's that's exactly what it is. Um, you can do both. You can you can split up what you're running against because right now we're just seeing if we, uh, let's look at that playbook again. So, so far, we've just been saying, hey, run against all hosts. But yes, you can say run against uh, this group of hosts. You can specify multiple groups of hosts. Um, and you can also take those variables that are associated with hosts and use those in your playbooks, which is what we're doing here 
Uh, let's say we want to set up syslog, but of course in different data centers, we have different syslog servers. Um, I'm using something a little different here, template, which is going to take a file off my machine and template it. Uh, where did I put that? And just for demo, I'm going to take that variable and just put it right at the top. Got some music in between them. All right, so this is doing that templating action where it's taking that template file, but replacing it with the, the inventory variable that we have. East server, west server. Where did you go? It should be there. It really should work. Let's see, let's just look. Did it made a change? Well, you should see it there. Oh. All right, I lost my connection to my other machines. Why is that not logging in? All right, I'll do it over here. I was looking at it on the right machine. All right, so on the rail server, you can see West server place the, uh, the variable. So uh, yes, split up machines, you can you can pull those inventory variables, do lots of different things. Um, like, oh my goodness. Like in this one, you would just run this against the web servers. Uh, so hey, I want to set up a web server. I can just hit the group web group and then you know create my web group create an account you know make me a, a root path for that install nginx do all kinds of stuff i could take templates if i had templated websites copy those over do all kinds of great stuff right and that would just run against my web servers right in the inventory um, you can also conditionally run tasks so here we're going back to to all but uh say if i want to delete them but only if we're throwing the gauntlet down and say no we love nano uh i can run this task that'll do that'll remove them from the system but only if this variable is specified uh down here we can taunt users and say hey run this uh run this raw command send them a message hey you gotta use arch you know but now this pulls that ansible os family remember i said it's running this uh, the setup module is grabbing all these device facts at the beginning. Well, there's one of those variables that's in there, Ansible OS family, Debian, Red Hat, um, uh, things like that. So if it finds that variable, it, it matches that, um, uh, that string you put in, then it's going to run that command, right? And I'm trying to figure out why those do. Mm. That stinks. So I'm gonna, uh, oh yeah, oh, the fun one, yeah, okay. So last one, um, all that's kind of cool, writing a lot of stuff, you can do a lot of great stuff. And we use, you know, we use playbooks like that a lot, just really simple ones uh, to do things. We have uh, some that'll go in and grab some information, make small changes, and, and that's great. But uh, when you get to where you wanna do some bigger things, you might wanna expand out into um, some bigger concepts. And Ansible has something called roles, R-O-L-E-S. Uh, and what that is, it's, it's a structure of files that includes variables, plays, um, 
all kinds of different information and it really, really expands on what you can do uh, with Ansible. It, it structures the files so they're easier to use, um, they're easier to share, and where is it? Available on Ansible Galaxy. Uh, that's kind of the central hub for code sharing for Ansible. Uh, if you need to do something in your environment, like seriously with Ansible, I would go to Galaxy and see what they have available. Likely somebody's already written a role that contains the tasks uh, to do what you need to do. Uh, and we're talking about, I mean, the stuff that we've looked at here, because we put this together so quick, is very simple. I mean, just adding a user and, and setting up a web server, that's, that's easy. Uh, this stuff we're talking about, um, full-on tasks for managing network devices, like everything on the device, or installing a Splunk cluster. You know, you want to go out and install a, a multi-tier Splunk cluster. Well, there's probably a role for that that'll do everything you need. You just feed it some variables for your environment, and it'll do that. Um, and since we're in a, a security meeting, uh, one of the interesting ones is, we're search, there we go. Sticks. Everybody loves sticks. Sticks are fantastic, and they are a pain to apply sometimes. Um, well, there's probably a stig for what you're trying to do. Uh, this one's kind of nice because it's written by Red Hat, so you can probably trust it. If it was written by, you know, John three three eight nine, I might bet the code a little more than that. But you know, it's written by Red Hat. Uh, so again, this is a it's what's called an Ansible role. It's a collection of code that's going to do a lot of stuff. They'll tell you about it here. They'll tell you what version you need. They'll tell you how to install it, give you a sample of how to use it, tell you uh, to go here, which doesn't work anymore. Um, but uh, this role has a list of variables that you can, you can use to customize it. Cause you know, when you're applying a STIG, you know, depending on what you're applying it to, you can really break some stuff. Uh, so fortunately, the group that wrote this gave you some ability to modify what it's doing uh, to customize it to your environment. Maybe you don't want to run the whole thing. You just want to run a little bit. So let's run this because this is fun, right? We like to break stuff. Uh, so it's going to tell you how to install it. And I didn't do this beforehand because I want to show you just how easy it is to use Ansible Galaxy. Look at that. Oh, boom, it's installed. It's done. That's great. All right. And how do we use it? Well, we got to right click. But it's really simple for this in this case, uh, because this rel stig uh, role that we're doing, it contains all the tasks we need. I just need to tell Ansible to run it. So I wrote me a little playbook. Uh, executing against all hosts, this is a rel a stig, but we're using that conditional. Hey, if it's a Red Hat distribution and it's major version eight, because it's a rel a stig, then you can run it. Otherwise, skip, right? And we're just including this role that we downloaded, this rel8 role. Now let's run that. And we're going to let that run uh, because it's really just a matter of knowing that you can do it. But what you want to see first, first thing it did was skip Ubuntu. All right. It pulled those facts down and said, hey, that's a Debian distribution. Skip. But it's going to run against Red Hat. Uh, we didn't look at how we can change this role against, we just Leroy Jenkins this, right? Um, <laughs> but there it goes, <laughs> Leroy, all right. And, and it's running and you can see some of the stuff is green. Okay, it's not making any changes. Some of the stuff is yellow, it's making changes. Um, fortunately, I mean, Red Hat's pretty professional about this. They're like, hey, uh, you can really break some stuff with this. It says it in here somewhere, you guys can come read it later. Um, but we don't care because we're just gonna tear this down later. But it's going. And I mean, if you can imagine, like in our environment, we have, I don't know, one area, we may have 600 Linux machines. But I mean, if you, you wouldn't take this and just say, hey, go to town, you know, you, you would tune it. But imagine, you know, even if you did a little bit of tuning and you could run this on groups at a time, this is me. I could hit that playbook and go, hey, want to lunch? I'll check it in a little bit, you know? versus somebody sitting down and, and stigging every machine. Even if you could do a portion of this to, to get some stig out of it, it is great. Uh, run this on your machines when you bootstrap them. You know, have a playbook that 
that does all the stuff we did. It adds the users, SSH key, it runs the SIG, it, you know, then you got a nice clean machine, your app team can come in and install something. So we'll let that run, but I mean, you've seen the output, you see what it's doing, uh, and that's great. So, and that's it. Um, again, like I was telling Aaron, this is just real basic. Somebody hadn't done this, they want to get out and do it. Well, now you've seen some stuff that you can do with it, you know, how easy it is to, to write some of the basic stuff and making it complicated is just adding more of that onto it, really. Uh, it, it's free, Ansible code, like um, Dave and I were talking about, this is free and, and you can get it, but it's, you know, as far as from a logging perspective, um, it's, it's limited. You're just running an application. Uh, Red Hat has a Any product. Gotchas? Any gotchas? Uh, yeah, don't do what I just did and, and, and go to town. <laughs> um, it, so it's, we're moving into that uh, away from the old, I like to call it click, yeah, click ops. You know, we're moving away from that into more of a uh, infrastructure as code and, and all this as code and uh, in type environment. So it's, it becomes more of a, um, you need to think more about your processes at that point because now we're thinking about things up front, whether it's before I could sit down in the machine and I could fumble my way through it and I could go to the next machine and I could do it. And it's, it's not going to be consistent, but I didn't have to think a lot about it. I kind of, you know, I'm a Unix professional and I can sit down and I can do this. When you get into something like this to do it right, you really need to have that, that engineering mindset, that development mindset of, of I've got to set this up to begin with. Um, where am I going to store my code? How are we going to do things? You know, what's our standard going to be? Because now everything's going to be exactly the same. You're running that playbook and it's the same. So it's not really a gotcha. It's just, it's That's something to think about. Structure. Yeah. But yeah, definitely with the gotchas. Um, <laughs> one demo I told Rob that I'm, that I'm not actually going to run. I was going to uh, update like the sudoers file and say, whoops, you know, I forgot to verify that config. You know, if you screw up sudoers file, you're, you're kind of, you're dork. Um, Ansible is not going to stop you. It says, hey, you, you told me to copy this file out. I, I did it across your whole environment. Uh, have a nice day, you know? <laughs> and of course, if, if you mess up your SSH access or however you're accessing it, then there's, there's no way to get that back from Ansible. You know, it's, it's a console cable or however you're doing it. Um, yeah, that, and again, that's the front thinking. Hey, right. think before do. Uh, cause now we can like ghostbusters, you know, Hey, we can do more damage that way. It's, it's exactly what we're doing. Uh, but what I was saying, and I thought I had a bookmark for this red hat has a product and again, rise is vendor agnostic, but, uh, we're talking about Ansible here. So red hat has a product called tower, uh, kind of cool. Uh, and it, it solves some of these problems that that we were talking about a second ago. Uh, for one, it gives you this nice GUI interface. Um, also, it gives you the ability to, uh, to have better monitoring, um, have better uh, control over who's doing things. Because if you're running your automation environment like I was, anybody that has access to that Linux machine and those playbooks can, can run it. You know, they can put a variable in that says, hey, make this setting blank and, and screw things up. Uh, with Tower, well, now you have this this nice um, environment that is uh, role-based, role-based access control. People are having to log in. Uh, it manages your playbooks, uh, manages inventories, uh, even has secrets management. So if you have passwords that you need for certain things, if your passwords to go out and grab information or passwords to access devices, uh, it's stored in there. And of course, the nice thing about that is nobody's seeing them now because it's it's stored in there away from everybody. You don't give everybody access to these passwords anymore. Uh, just some really nice benefits. Um, of course, this is a, uh, I believe it's licensed per device, um, but but there is a free-ish version called AWX. Um, and Lee may know a little bit more about this. I haven't used it yet, but very closely related. Um, if you need a free version, I think it operates similarly to Tower. I've just never used, I've used Tower a little bit, but not AWX. But if you're gonna go home and lab this, check out AWX, uh, get a lot of those benefits. Um, and one thing I didn't show, last thing I'll say, uh, 
I kind of built up Ansible at the front and said, hey, you can manage all this great stuff. Uh, and, you know, they have a page for that uh, integrations, which even that, you know, the nice logos on there don't cover everything that it does. Um, but really, we looked here, we're, we're managing Linux servers. We're SSA, Ansible's SSHing in and doing that. It can do so much more. Um, you know, we use it for managing F5 devices, Cisco devices. Uh, you can use it for cloud stuff. I think you, you said you're using it for some AWS stuff, right? Um, and of course, you're not SSHing to that. Ansible handles that through other plugins that it can, it can manage things through SSH. It can manage it through uh, HTTP, you are like a REST uh, URI and things like that. So don't think you're locked into devices that, that have Python and use SSH. No, it's, it has many more connectors to things uh, and can manage it like that. So as long as somebody in, in the community has done it, and is, this has a lot of vendor support because it's really popular now, um, as long as somebody's written a connector for it, written some modules for it, you can manage it. So that's all I have. Any other questions? <laughs> I switched over to VS Code exclusively now. I've got it set up. It's a nice dark environment. And I love it. Yeah. I know there's a few Vim people in here that I, I can torque on a little bit. But. I got a question for you. So we had a network uh, scripting class that used to be PowerShell. So we just swapped that over to Ansible. We developed that. By the way, can I steal those slides? It's better than what we did. No. <laughs> but, um, so how do you how do you see uh, those two playing? Hard to say. Um, I, you know, in in our environment, Ansible Ansible has been a slow, little slow on the uptake, mm -hmm. and that's that's a cultural thing. Um, and, I mean, in a professional environment, you, you know how things work. Some people are there nine to five, you know, they just want to punch in and out. They don't want to learn something new. They know their, their PowerShell. Uh, that's all they're going to do. Um, I, I think there's use for both still. I, I, I don't think the skills that people develop in like PowerShell are going away still. Uh, this would just be a good addition to that. And, uh, you know, it's, we talked about the modules. There's, there's ways to run raw commands, even with Ansible, because it doesn't have modules written for everything. Uh, so you can still run raw commands, and I mean, it, it would still I mean, be useful really for that. It's really slick unless you do a ton of stuff, but like you showed, you know, it, you can grab something, run it, and if you don't have a nice dev environment <laughs> as an out first, you have no idea what's behind it. Right. And so Absolutely. then you're kind of a script kitty guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spray and pray, right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Well, thanks, Ed. Appreciate it, man. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Well, like I said, uh, hang out, drink some more beer because we have an awful lot of it. And um, we will be meeting again next month with the FBI here. So we'll see you guys next month. Would you teach my first class for me? <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. See you, Hugh. When is that? No, we've already, uh, we've had a couple of pilots. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Eric was a good one. Don't ask him. He don't have yeah. that yeah. experience. Get <laughs> <laughs> the fire hose. Hugh huh? <laughs> says awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Hugh. All I'll say is you really need to be a very good typist. The camera will need to be along. Yeah. <laughs> like I told you, that's forty-five percent of my mistakes were script errors. Oh yeah, spacing and yeah. we'll run to the restroom. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ran into that a few times here setting that up. But the good thing is, if you have like, you know, the the development environments now handle all that, they'll do conversions. Oh yeah, it's it's great. I, yeah. I, so I noticed that the JQ, you, you're talking about JQ, you're talking about JSON. Have you found Ron? What is it? Ron, G R O N. It is, I think it stands for Breakable Object Notation. So it's a different structure. Sort of. You feed it to JSON, and it provides the entire hierarchy of the JSON object on canvas in every line. 
So it's the idea is that if I'm prepping for all my ends, I'll have a, I take my JSON, I type it to ground, and then I can prep for Ansible. And I can see where at in that JSON. Good night. It's really cool. Like, basically, that entire hierarchy of the tree that you can see in JSON, it puts all that, that's every single thing on the screen. It's so much just like, it also does some funny things where it will come back and sort your dictionary objects and the other things and go with this. I was absolutely shocked. I won't be able to list it. Absolutely. No, I don't. I literally got I mean, they're not doing anything I haven't done. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to maintain. Yeah. 